Let me, on behalf of the board, management, and staff of the Central Bank, welcome you all to our 28th Dr. Eric Williams Memorial Lecture. As Nicole has just mentioned, this year, on December 12th, the Central Bank will be celebrating its 50th anniversary. This is a remarkable milestone, not only for the bank, but for the country. And it is through initiatives like the Dr. Eric Williams Memorial Lecture that we intend, as a central bank and as a national institution, to continue to promote the development of our country. The bank is not only interested in maintaining monetary and economic stability in Trinidad and Tobago. And while that may, of course, be our first priority, it is not our only priority. We want, as a national institution, to continue to contribute to the development of our country. That is why today you will see in the audience some enthusiastic young men from Dr. Williams's alma mater, Queen's Royal College. And we do have some students from several tertiary education institutions. We hope this lecture, which is now in its 28th year, will leave a solid legacy for our nation's young minds. The history of the Central Bank and our country are so closely intertwined that it is quite fitting that we make the connection that exists between the two. Tonight's lecture is no different. Dr. Williams, on whom this lecture focuses, was a strong believer in education and understanding our history so we could shape our future. And as we leave our mark in history for our 50th anniversary, it was quite fitting that we invite Professor Knight to be our guest speaker. As a professor of history, he of course knows all too well how our history shapes our future. The Caribbean, as many of us know, is at a turning point as we come face to face with the history we thought we had left behind. Economies are being moved and shaped by our decisions and of course by decisions made outside of the region. But at the same time, I think we seem to forget as people of the Caribbean that we have been part of the global economy, especially since the 15th century. So we do have a long history in helping to shape and form our world economy that we see before us. And I think that is something that we should not ever forget and not be besieged by the whirlpool of uncertainty that sometimes seems to engulf us. I want to tell you a simple point that I believe makes a strong case for the bank's vision behind this lecture. The Central Bank Tower is located in the Eric Williams Financial Complex. Our home, the heart of the country's financial stability and development, is right here on this very spot. And it's a spot that is named in the honor of Dr. Williams. Few people may not even realize this, as there are no official signs saying Eric Williams Financial Complex. I am not sure why this is the case, but I will certainly look into it and rectify this apparent oversight that, <coughs> that exists. So this physical bond must be remembered and respected by the central bank itself. We operate in such a powerful spot where the life, development, and sustenance of our country emanates. We have a heavy responsibility to protect and maintain Dr. Williams's contribution. We pride ourselves on the success of our Eric Williams Memorial Lecture. It is one of the few active tributes to the memory and work of the man who helped our country to independence. Only a few weeks ago, the bank held the first ever Dr. Rudranath Kapildeo Legacy Lecture entitled From Lion House to Legend, which was also a 50th anniversary initiative that forms part of the bank's trust to maintain the legacy of those who have shaped this great nation of ours. Without the work and forethought of leaders like Dr. Williams and Dr. Kapileu, Trinidad and Tobago would not be in the favorable position we find ourselves in the Caribbean. 
As you sit back and listen to Professor Knight speak on the topic that deals with the world after Eric Williams, you will start to question your own legacy and how all your history has influenced your present and, <clears throat> and will influence your future state. Professor Knight is no stranger to Caribbean history, being a son of Jamaica. Incidentally, last year's lecture was also delivered by a Jamaican poet and author, Rachel Manley. <clears throat> As a graduate of the University College of the West Indies, London, in September 1964, Professor Knight was one of the 12 persons accepted to the History Honors Program. And so his journey began. His formative years at the university would prepare him for his masters at the University of Wisconsin, where he studied comparative tropical history. He was required to choose two geographical areas for study. He chose Latin America and Africa. His dissertation would focus on Caribbean slave societies. Clearly, there are common themes with Professor Knight's work and Dr. Williams's. It is at this university that he would also meet his charming wife, who was pursuing the same course of studies. In 1969, he obtained his PhD from the University of Wisconsin, and in 1973, he joined the faculty of the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. In 1991, he was appointed Leonard and Helen R. Stolman Professor of History. Dr. Knight speaks to us tonight as a historian, an expert on Caribbean history. His research interests focus on social, political, and cultural aspects of Latin America and the Caribbean, especially after the 18th century, as well as on American slave systems in their comparative dimensions. He has served on many boards and has lived a traveler's dream, lecturing across America, Europe, Japan, and Australia. He has published several books, articles, and volumes, including Slave Society in Cuba during the 19th century, The Caribbean, The Genesis of a Fragmented Nationalism, and The Modern Caribbean, which he co-edited with Colin Palmer, Speaker the 25th, Eric Williams Memorial Lecture. It is the bank's opinion that Professor Knight is the ideal candidate to give this year's lecture because of his extensive research on the history of the Caribbean, its change in face, and how well it responds to economic and political pressures, both at home and abroad. He has lived both in the Caribbean and in the Americas, and can give a first-hand experience of how different our societies have evolved. And yesterday at lunch, I also found out that he's an expert on Cuba, Caribbean rum, and World Cup football. So I have this sneaky suspicion that somehow these aspects would be weaved into his speech tonight. Over the past 27 years, the bank has celebrated the work and vision of Dr. Williams in discussions on the challenges of Caribbean leadership, including on race, politics, and the African-American image the promise of Caribbean unity, and the emergence of the national energy sector. Tonight, we continue by shedding light on Dr. Williams's comprehensive understanding of Caribbean history as we celebrate his legacy to our country and our region. We hope his work and vision would continue to inspire our nation. It is therefore with great pleasure that I invite Professor Franklin Knight to deliver the 28th Dr. Eric Williams Memorial Lecture. I thank you. Honorable Chief Justice, uh, Mrs. Rodriguez Archer, Cabinet Ministers, the Honorable Orville London, Chief Secretary <coughs> of the Tobago House of Assembly, the Honorable Keith Rowley, Leader of the Opposition, and Mrs. Rowley. Your Excellences, Heads of Missions, and other members of the Diplomatic Corps. Justices of the Supreme Court. 
members of the Senate, members of the House of Representatives, secretaries of the Tobago House of Assembly, representatives of international organizations, senior public servants, former governors and directors of the Central Bank, the management team of the Central Bank, the distinguished ladies and gentlemen of the audience. I want to thank you first, oh, I forgot the governor, <laughs> and his magnificent introduction. It's enough to intimidate anyone from Jamaica. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for this invitation to share this extremely important moment with you. Not only is it an important moment in the history of Trinidad and Tobago and of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, it is also in the history of Jamaica. And the commemoration of 50 years reminds me that I first came to Trinidad in 1962 to participate in your independence. I have come back several times since, but never on an occasion like this in such splendor as you have shown me. And I want to thank you very much. The occasion of this 28th Eric Williams lecture is a moment for us to pause and contemplate the area in which we live and the world of which we are a part at this turning point in history. Dr. Eric Williams, as a scholar and statesman, was an extraordinary Caribbean individual. He was from Trinidad, but he belonged to the entire Caribbean and indeed to the entire world. His scholarship and his political career is reified in that majestic poem which he loved so much, A Psalm of Life by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and particularly the verse which says, lives of great men all remind us, we can make our lives sublime, and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. And Dr. Williams did leave enormous footprints on the sands of time. But coming to Trinidad to speak on any aspect of Dr. Williams is akin to the well-known English idiomatic expression of taking coals to Newcastle. What could I tell you that you did not know before? Or what could I tell you that you haven't heard these past 28 years by a distinguished list of speakers. And if I had been shown the list before I accepted the invitation, I would have reconsidered immediately. How could I possibly follow? W. Arthur Lewis, the Honorable P.J. Patterson, Professor Rex Nettleford, Professor Arnold Ramprasad, Professor Nigel Harris, Professor Colin Palmer, Sir Sridath Ramphal. These are giants in the intellectual sphere. There are names that causes a modest scholar like myself to tremble. But I find solace in the thought that maybe you have heard the best. So now you're trying your plan B to bring in the rest. <laughs> and so here I am. Eric Williams did much to shape our world not only intellectually, but politically. In his highly original and inspirationally insightful thesis of his major work, Capitalism and Slavery, he connected in a more direct and sophisticated way, more direct and sophisticated than previously done, the dynamic relationship between imperialism, slavery, and the rise of industrial capitalism. And despite the extraordinary, extensive controversy surrounding the original thesis, no historian has been able 
to demolish the basic argument set forth by Dr. Williams in 1944. The Williams thesis, as it came to be called, is far more sophisticated than most of his critics realized. <clears throat> Dr. Williams was not talking merely about economic changes, but also about fundamental changes in the social basis of political economy. While I am confident that much light will be offered on the essential argument relating to slavery and the rise of British and wider European and North American capitalism, it is important to make two initial observations. The first, of course, is that Williams did not couch his language narrowly in simple profit accrual and reinvestment as some economic determinants like Roger Anstey and others mistakenly indicate. But rather, he posited a complex, catalytically inducing process in which the employment of slaves represented market capital with an additional and unique capacity to produce further capital. On the one hand, slaves were a marketable commodity that could, like any other commercial merchandise, be bought and sold profitably. On the other hand, slaves directly produced other marketable commodities in a system that stimulated forward and backward economic linkages. African slaves were therefore valuable property that created further market value by their mechanical and manual industry. In fact, in a bank like this, it's fitting to say it's like putting your money, a $10 bill, in your wallet, and it comes out as a $50 bill or a $100 bill. I'm not sure the capitalists would like that, but the thought is delicious. That was the essential link between capitalism and slavery and the important role that, had, that was developed and has to be developed along the way. The second observation is that in the absence of a reliable international banking system, the slave-run complexes facilitated the transition from bullionism, which is the use of bullion to estimate national and individual wealth, to mercantilism, the attempt to restrict imperial trade to national carriers within imperial boundaries, to free trade, where participants need not be connected at all, except by market involvement. Capitalism opened the marketplace for private participants to operate with a minimum of governmental control and regulations. And sugar production and trade stimulated the first attempts at transnational commerce. Dr. Williams saw the imperial activities of Europeans as driven by the urge to promote capitalism via non-restricting market-driven mechanisms, an idea that goes back to the early 18th century, and certainly to the Scottish philosopher Adam Smith and the French philosopher Guillaume Thomas Francois Reynal, better known as the Abbe Reynal. Capitalism and slavery touched a metaphorical nerve because it countered, it, it, it countered the then conventional British conviction that a religiously based humanitarianism was at the forefront of the British attempts to end the slave trade and emancipate the slaves. Yet, the economic dimension should not be the only focus of Williams's thinking, because it was not. Instead, it was the reorientation of European historical thought relating to the Caribbean, and that is part of its missed importance. As historian Barry Higman has pointed out in volume six of the UNESCO General History of the Caribbean, Williams set out to unsettle and destroy the pillars of the old colonial order, not the least of all in its intellectual aspect. For him, history was a battleground on which imperialist politics struggles against nationalist politics. So one observation that we should take away from reading Dr. Williams is that no one should be afraid to challenge conventional wisdom regardless of its antiquity, as 
Lord Tennyson said in Mort Darter, the old order changeth, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. Not only must we challenge what we see and hear, but we must be able to develop the confidence to resist going with the flow, simply because it is the easier path to pursue. Caribbean states today, never could, afford the luxury to relax in the contemporary world. For the people of the Caribbean, the struggle for survival is eternal. Eric Williams had a deep conviction shared by many others of his generation that Caribbean peoples had a history no less worthy than the peoples from other parts of the globe, especially from Europe. His writings gave dynamic agency to the people of the Caribbean in the same way that C.L.R. James's Black Jacobins gave agency to the rebellious slaves in the French colony of saint domingue at the end of the 18th century. And it is also found in most modern histories of the Caribbean, beginning with, Eric, with Elsa Govaya's slave society in the British Leeward Islands. So, if there is one thing we can take away from the historical writings of Dr. Williams, it is this. The teaching of Caribbean history dramatically needs overhauling and constant overhauling. Instead of mining history to substantiate complicated claims for reparations, we should be rewriting Caribbean history and inculcating it among the common people to establish the singular importance of the Caribbean in the history of the modern world. It is crucially important, it seems to me, that people in the Caribbean understand fully the importance of their past. The Caribbean has a past that did not begin and end with the tragic experience of African enslavement, although that was an important phase in the history of the Caribbean. And the Caribbean has had a history as the governor of the bank pointed out before, that is truly global, at least since 1492. So if Caribbean peoples realize the important role they have played in the history of the modern world, then they, like the Greeks and the Romans, will think much better of themselves. Moreover, if they did great things in the past, and they truly did, then they may be able to recapture that spirit to, to do great things in the future. And therein lays one of the ancillary benefits of being a historian, apart from being marginally employable. <clears throat> this is not the place or time to develop new guidelines for the teaching of Caribbean history. And many in the audience and elsewhere would say that I am hardly the person to begin such an enterprise. But think of some of the observations that could be shared and should be shared among all Caribbean people, regardless of linguistic and cultural background. The first, of course, is that the Caribbean and Latin America constitute an extraordinarily important region for world history, at least after the arrival of Christopher Columbus in 1492, and probably until after the Second World War in the middle of the 20th century. No area of the world can be properly studied without reference to the Caribbean and Latin America after 1492. And why do I say this? <clears throat> Just think of a few of the propositions. First, of course, in the Caribbean, Europeans created an entirely new, singularly hybridized population that was unique in the history of demographic expansion anywhere. Immigrants from Africa and Europe and Asia procreated between themselves as well as with remnants of the rapidly decimated indigenous population. And together, they established in situ colonies of settlers and colonies of exploiters 
along a spectrum of community formation that until today presents a sort of plural society sui generis. If Caribbean societies are considered more receptive to outsiders, and I think they are, it is because they possess an inherent understanding and empathy toward diversity. You may say it is basic to their DNA. In the second place, Latin America and the Caribbean produced enough gold and silver to totally upset the valuation of bullion around the world. Between 1503 and 1650, Latin America and the Caribbean exported approximately 17 million kilograms of silver and more than 180,000 kilograms of gold to Spain, not much of which arrived there, of course. Altogether, that is some 17,000 short tons of silver and 180 short tons of gold. This extraordinary oversupply of precious bullion resulted in a 400% inflation rate, devaluating local European currencies and increasing dramatically the price of goods. And it also made gold and silver the standard forms of international payments around the world. In the third place, all the vast American treasure that passed through the Caribbean forced the construction by the Spanish around the Caribbean of important fortified port cities, cities such as Havana or Veracruz or Cartagena or San Juan de Puerto Rico or Santo Domingo. And these cities helped to transform the area. Very few people realize that in 1790, Havana was the third largest city in the Western Hemisphere, exceeded only by Mexico City and Lima. It was about three times the size of Rio de Janeiro. It was about three times the size of New York City. It had 90,000 people, as I indicated. New York City had a little over 33,000. Philadelphia had a little over 28,000. Boston had less than 20,000. And even uh, Baltimore, and I have to refer to Baltimore because I have lived there so long, more than half my life, but also the Caribbean has very important connections to Baltimore. Baltimore was just a large village of 13,500. So one of the largest cities in the Western Hemisphere at that time did play an important role in the community transformation of the Americas. In the fourth place, Latin America and the Caribbean resulted in what Alfred Crosby has described as the Columbian Exchange, that massive transfer of people, plants, and animals that fundamentally transformed the entire geographical environment of the Americas. So that today, 60% of all the world's food crops originated in the Americas. The fifth observation is that Latin America and the Caribbean provided the Europeans with an opportunity to develop long distance administrative techniques, thereby increasing or uh, creating cystadial and synchronic variations to colonialism and imperialism. And I will define what I mean by cystadial and synchronic a little later. In the sixth place, the Caribbean and Latin America became the foundation for an Atlantic economic zone that facilitated, as Dr. Eric Williams demonstrated, and I have referred to before, as the transition from bullionism in the 17th century to capitalism and industrialism in the 19th century. In the seventh place, the Caribbean and Latin America contributed three in Haiti, Mexico, and Cuba, three of the seven great transformative political revolutions in the history of the modern world. And this leads me to a second category of observation, a little different from the ones I have just enumerated, and that is the importance of the Haitian Revolution to not only the Caribbean, but to world history. 
Just as the United States of America pioneered political democracy, Haiti pioneered social democracy. Indeed, the Haitian Revolution was the most thoroughly revolutionary experience in human history. Haitians not only extended liberty and equality to all members of their community, they transformed their political, economic, and social systems in one fell swoop. More than anywhere else, Haitians transformed the social basis of political power, and that is the best definition of a political revolution. One consequence of the Haitian democratic social revolution was to spread, and here are the words belong to Anthony Mingo, a terrified consciousness throughout all slave and slaveholding societies from Boston to Buenos Aires. The general abolition of slavery in the Americas, therefore, really began with the slave revolt in the French colony of saint domingue in August of 1791. By destroying the finest of Napoleon Bonaparte's French army, Haitians made possible the Louisiana Purchase, the most notorious land bargain in the history of the world. For three cents per acre, Thomas Jefferson doubled the size of his country and expanded his new nation state from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Without the history of the Haitian Revolution, the history of the Americas, not just the United States of America would have been entirely different. Haiti also inadvertently revitalized the Caribbean sugar business by stimulating expansion in, among other places, Cuba, Trinidad, and British Guiana, now Guiana, and expanded it to South Africa and Australia. It transformed the sugar business, not just by stimulating new geographical areas of production, but the Haitian Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars that followed led to the development of beet sugar, breaking the monopoly of sugarcane and upsetting sugar markets for more than 100 years, or at least until the 1970s, when high fructose concentrates came to dominate the market. So now we speak not of a sugar market, but of a sweetener market. And two equally uh, important points that I might add to this. The first is that in our reorganization of our history and restating of the importance of our area, we should never refer to Haiti as a failed state as it is so often done today, nor should we identify it with chronic poverty and political instability. Haiti was established in 1804, the second independent state in the Western Hemisphere, the first black republic in the history of the world. And over this period of time, it has had identi the identical number of presidents as the United States of America. Well, you might say that's no big deal. But I would say to you, next door to Haiti is the Dominican Republic. Haiti has had 44 presidents, just like the United States. The Dominican Republic, established in 1844, constituted properly in 1864, has had 53 presidents to date, and still counting, but is never considered to be a politically unstable state, nor uh, is it treated, tarred with indelible brush of political instability that its neighbor seems to attract. And Haiti was never chronically poor. This is, again, one of the things that, unfortunately, is hard to explain to people. Uh, but the literature is all there. The facts are all there. Despite the crippling reparations imposed on Haiti in 1825 by France, Haiti managed to survive quite well until 1861, not only paying off the onerous French-imposed war reparations, but maintaining one of the highest per capita incomes in the Americas. The beginning of the end was the American Civil War that destroyed Haitian commerce. And until the 1890s, Haiti was ranked among the leading Caribbean states in terms of its per capita income. What did Haiti in in the 1890s? 
was, of course, the pre precipitous fall in the price of world coffee, its major export as it tried to keep up. And from that, they never recovered. That was the Haitian catastrophe, not the fact that it had a civil war and it didn't treat some of its earlier leaders too well. We haven't been too bad in that respect either. That is the background. Now for the past 50 years and what we have done and what we hope to do for the next 50 and beyond. One of the things we should begin to reflect on is the fact, of course, that, and I speak for myself here because this seems to be an unusually young audience, but I'm over 50 years old by far. I came here as an uh, untamed youth to the independence of Trinidad and Tobago. And with today's life expectancies going around 80 years, uh, many of us can hope that some of us in the audience will be around for the centenary of the independence of Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. But I come not to really praise the past and predict bountiful tomorrows. What is past is past. And the past, we cannot do anything about at this moment. We cannot change it. We can only seek to draw some lessons and some wisdom from our ancestors and hope that future generations will be kind to our observations of our past. Societies, after all, are not necessarily better or worse. They just get to be different. History does not follow a linear path, and no two societies follow a common route. Root. We speak about uh, the Caribbean as if this is a monolithic area, and we speak about any country as if it is a consolidated and uniform community. No two societies can ever be the same, nor can any society be the same at two different periods in time. That was the earlier reference to my uh, description of cystadial, which means a similar stage, but not at the same time, and synchronic, which is a similar time. For many countries, 50 years is like the blinking of an eye, an extremely short period of time. And that is my first observation tonight. Focusing on 50 years of the history of Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago is important, but we ought to remember that these nation states are still in their infancies. They have time on their hands, more time than you and I have. And as that South African proverb says, time is longer than rope. What have Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago accomplished in their first 50 years? And what are the challenges for the next 50 and more? Have they? as some would proclaim, and I sometimes see it in the local press, seen their best years? Have they become, as Edward Gibbon Wakefield once described the United States in the 1830s, as a country rotten before it's ripe? Both states, of course, derive from a common colonial lineage, but we can only generally describe that as being on parallel paths, not identical paths. Uh, Jamaica is larger, has had a much more diversified experience as an English colony, and Trinidad has a much more interesting but shorter British colonial experience. If it can be said then that Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, despite their common legacy, in the 20th century of British colonialism, developed two different political cultures by the middle of the 20th century, when universal uh, adult suffrage was introduced to the British Caribbean, then it is not surprising that they should be different all along, not just at the moment, but in the future as well. And yet, when we try to generalize, as inevitably we do, 
The first 50 years have not been altogether bad for these two states. In the first place, they have survived politically and maintained a reasonably stable political situation in an intensely and increasingly intensely turbulent world. That is not a bad achievement, especially in these days when we are going for the lowest common denominator, for these perilous times. There are areas in which Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago have made significant, though not unqualified, of course, progress over the past 50 years. And compared to the beginning 50 years of other states, they have a lot to be proud of. In the first 50 years, the United States had, among other political transgressions, faced down a whiskey rebellion. Can't see why they would do that and not just drink the whiskey. <laughs> but I have some different inclinations, I suppose. Witnessed the dueling death of one of its most important founders, one of Caribbean ancestry. Fought a major war with its former metropolis, the War of 1812 and was on the point of tearing itself apart on the issue of slavery. That was quite an inauspicious start for a country that pioneered political engineering in 1776 and pontificated about human rights toward the end of the 18th century. Or take Ghana, which got its independence just before the process started in the British Caribbean. Ghana was the pride of African states when it gained its independence in the middle of the 20th century, and it was an inspiration for many emerging states in the 1960s. But within 10 years, it had its founder overthrown, and it took a long time for Ghana to recover political stability. Or look at our neighboring Latin American states. Perhaps, compared with Jamaica or Trinidad and Tobago, perhaps only Chile and Brazil avoided that long period of political uh, instability that plagued, and in the case of, say, Colombia, continues to plague the uh, area of Latin America today. So compared with many modern countries, we can say that the British Caribbean is relatively stable, and on the surface at least, politically democratic. I'm not about to swear on that last one, but um, we'll take it. If we look at the national elections in Trinidad and Tobago and in Jamaica, they have been fairly regularly, fairly predictable. And I will speak a little more a little later about the political culture that I mentioned earlier, because although it's working now, one has to think about the future of this political system. So the first, of course, is that the political climate is not bad. The second is a consideration for civil society over the last 50 years and in the immediate future. And I, here I must begin by saying that the idea of civil society had its origin in Aristotle. The modern concept of civil society is uh, that we now have is mostly a monstrous American-created semantic redundancy because you cannot have an uncivil society. That's a contradiction in terms. Societies are inherently civil, and it could not be otherwise, as I have said, because one cannot have a community of simply government, commerce, and laws. In the construction of civil society in which we bring together all the areas in which there is a government and a governed. Uh, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago have done pretty well. There have been no devastating civil conflicts. There are no institutionalized, institutionalized patterns of segregation or discrimination or particular exclusions. And in both societies, there is a very strong sense of national identity. And both are quite diverse societies, no matter how you define the word diversity. In an age when migration is looming as a major problem for many, for example, Jamaica healthily continues to accept 
migration as normative. And the same can be said, and perhaps even more so, of Trinidad and Tobago. Here in this society, it's 35.4% South Asian, 34.2% of African origin, 15.3% mixed, uh, and, and these mixtures are of all kinds. So uh, when we look at the demographic composition, we find not just in the phenotypes, but in the social and uh, religious cultures, there is a healthy diversity that is unusual in the Western Hemisphere. Today, Jamaica receives a small but steady stream of migrants from China, Cuba, Haiti, Colombia, and other countries. About 20,000 Latin Americans reside in Jamaica, and about 7,000 permanent residents in Jamaica come from the United States of America. And it's a society which, in general, is hospitable to all foreigners, or at least as hospitable to foreigners as it is to their fellow Jamaicans. And like most of the Caribbean, Jamaica shares a revolutionary past that permeates the structure of society and values. It endured a revolution. It had a revolutionary transformation in the post-slavery societies. And in fact, it continues to accept change as normative. A fourth area in which I would say that the Caribbean, the English-speaking Caribbean, particularly Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica have done well, is in education. Uh, despite the bemoaning of the declining standards of education, the system is impressively constructed and well calibrated so that you can pass from uh, the lower level to the higher levels in a more or less regular and predictable way. And for areas with small populations, Jamaica is about 2.8, Trinidad and Tobago about 1.2, Jamaica has five universities, uh, Trinidad and Tobago has three, and maybe you can throw in the Cipriani College, and you do have four. So the higher level of education is attended to in both societies. And permit me to make one passing mention about education in the Caribbean because this is one of the areas that do need attention despite the fact that we have this nice calibrated institution. That is a tendency, and I think I know where it comes from, of confusing education, which implies developing the mind and creating good citizens, with certification, which is merely a mechanism for employment self-relief. So these countries have a lot of certified people who are really insensitive semi-literates. Probably good in some areas, but not necessarily desirable for developing their communities. Of course, there are other areas that we could point to in culture and sports in which both societies are quite distinguished by any international system. So I will just go on to the final observation and then spend some minutes looking at really what are the problems and are we approaching them uh, in an intelligible way at the moment as I see it. Uh, the, the last area is the area of public health. And one of the areas of public health, uh, one of the observations about public health that's really very important across the Caribbean and Latin America is that a lot of people say, well, public health is terrible, it's terrible. And then when you look at life expectancies, which is a reflection of the quality of public health, people in Latin America and the Caribbean seem to live as long as people anywhere else in the world. Now, if the public health is that bad, then the rum must be better. <laughs> so you've got to find an explanation as to why they're living if you say these conditions are as deplorable. And in fact, by any of these measurements, the Caribbean compares favorably with the best in the world in terms of public health. And they pioneered some of these areas of public health going back to the 1920s. So now for some challenges. How do we keep this, these groups of societies going? How do we continue to promote national sovereignty 
which is not identical for every society, and everybody has to trade off some form of their national sovereignty in order to participate meaningfully in the global community. And here, history has been kinder to Trinidad and Tobago than to Jamaica. In the first decades of political independence in the 1960s, uh, Jamaica was enjoying some favorable economic winds of change. So uh, was the rest of the world. Uh, it was considered to be the decade of rising expectations. Uh, prices for exports were good. Domestic food supplies were good. Wage increases generally exceeded price increases, not just in the Caribbean, but across the Americas. So the middle sectors were expanding significantly. And what we didn't know then was that those years would not last forever. Since the 1970s, the economic winds of change have been generally unfavorable for Jamaica, as well as for the rest of the world. And even though it's less true for Trinidad and Tobago, the winds of change have become more unpredictable today. And the economic problems facing Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago have been exacerbated, I think, to some extent, by the institutional inadequacies, particularly in Jamaica, uh, which developed or were retained, constructed after their independence. The challenges to politics, to the economy, and to civil society in general have been in some cases severe. They have been multiple, they have been interrelated, and sometimes unexpected, and occasionally disastrous. And here is where policy development is really very important, because all the leaders of the Caribbean know this. It doesn't take me to come, I don't know how many thousand miles from Baltimore, to tell you this. Everybody knows about these challenges we have. But we have never really tried to cooperate in developing the types of planning programs that address the problems of the Caribbean, both in the short term and the long term. And let me briefly speak of four of the main, and there are many more, but I'm just, I have time for four, and I would like to leave here tomorrow sound in body. <laughs> and I know I have imposed myself on you for a very long time. But let me look at four of the problems that uh, are immediate on the horizon, and where sometimes the leadership falls short in approaching these. The first is the problem of economic sustainability in a rapidly globalizing world where production and productivity can be trumped by malicious, uncontrolled market manipulations. And this is true even in currency, but in all sorts of other areas. The second is the problem of the equality of meritocracy in a civil society. Uh, especially a civil society, and by this now I'm going global, in which we are approaching, despite our laws and our intelligence and all the wisdom that we've acquired over the centuries, a Hobbesian state of nature where more and more life is becoming nasty, brutish, and short. The third, it might be more peculiar to the Caribbean than elsewhere, is the problem of political succession, and political institution building, where the basic political parties seem to be prematurely ossified, and politics is guided less by consistent principles than by maximizing greed. And the fourth, of course, it's not peculiar to the area, but geographically we just find ourselves in the middle of it, is the global problem of narco-trafficking and civil violence that constitutes an unavoidable hazard to institutions and communities in this part of the world. And so let me expand very briefly on these four points. And let me start with the economic sustainability. In this increasingly globalized world, political stability is closely affiliated 
with economic sustainability. So everywhere across the Caribbean, given the relatively limited natural resources, less limited in some places like where we are today, uh, each Caribbean state will need to be untiring and increasingly creative in the pursuit of goals of economic sustainability. Across the Caribbean, with the possible exception of Cuba, which learned the lesson the very hard way, there is too great a dependence on a type of cargo cult mentality that some shining knight from abroad, not yours truly, uh, will arrive to solve all their problems. Or they think that there is a single magic permanent solution for all the problems at once. And elsewhere, if one goes to Costa Rica, if one goes to Madeira, if one goes to Mauritius, you'll find that they tend to identify the problems and separate them, and they have some sort of analysis which says, if you have this option over the short term, this is the consequence over the long term, or vice versa. Reality in the Caribbean is not seen as process, and yet it should be. We should be reminded, because we all learned it at some time or other, that the flower that blooms today, tomorrow dies, all that we wish to stay tempts and then flies. So we need to approach the problems that there is no permanent solution for any identified problem anywhere in the world. Resolving Caribbean problems requires consistent and seriously applied new ways of thinking, of anticipating problems, applying flexible solutions, and changing the mentality that you're going to fix everything permanently with one go. Each Caribbean state will, after all the fits and starts, find efficacy in cooperativeness, not necessarily as a confederated or unified system such as the European community, but rather by doing things that we can do well and effectively, uh, such as we have done with the weather. I was about to say with the cricket team, and then I remembered, oh well, I should think of something else. Um, but it is worth remembering, as John, Lon, uh, John Don advised us so long ago, no man is an island entire unto itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main, and that in cooperation you can achieve some specific goals at some moments of time. I know, being a Jamaican, that Jamaicans do not respond well at all to John Donne's exhortation. Uh, for example, although Jamaicans are not distinguished as international swimmers, they have demonstrated since 196, well, before 1962, a sort of penchant to jump ship prematurely and spontaneously which is not necessarily a good thing for a non-swimmer to do. But pushing for regional cooperation, I think, must begin at the local level. That if you're building a house, the components have got to be sound, and that is the way we should go about in cooperative action. The second, of course, is the nature of our societies. There is, despite this nicely calibrated educational system in the Caribbean, almost everywhere, and this is true now in Cuba, although I wouldn't have said this in Cuba 20 years ago, there is a gulf between the leaders and the led. And there is a growing manifestation that the leaders disrespect the led. And this is incompatible with general education. In fact, the leaders should be part of the whole community, exchanging ideas with them. That is democracy. And more and more, there is this division, and the gulf develops. Civil society cannot be successful if there is not a shared vision between those who want to create the ideas of a new society 
and those who are indifferent to such a creation, or in other words, between the haves and the have-nots. Civil society, and here we are using the term of bringing everybody together, is not accomplished by wishful thinking. It is accomplished when it is by difficult, unrelenting attention. Civility must be taught in the schools, it must be practiced in the communities, and it must be the basic principle of political operations. Without that, there is no community. The third is a political succession, and this is a major regional problem irrespective of the type of uh, political status or description. Neither in the stable democracies of the former English colonies nor in Cuba has the problem of political succession been properly institutionalized. The political parties in Jamaica, or in Trinidad and Tobago, or Guyana, or anywhere else you could name, seem to have problems attracting new young members who could vitalize their systems the way that one saw these systems revitalized in the 40s and 50s and early 60s. I could speak of Edward Siag or Ken Jones or David Tavares in Jamaica, or even actually they had a second change in Jamaica with Michael Manley and P.J. Patterson. And they one thought that there was going to be a way of institutionalizing the leadership. Instead, it doesn't seem to be happening anywhere at all. And it is important to institutionalize political succession because one of the things that is collapsing worldwide is the responsible fourth estate, the press. And in fact, with the type of journalism that we now have, maybe it's not uh, uh, too much to expect that it too should pass away. I know that some uh, places, and fortunately Trinidad and Tobago is one, have had in the Caribbean important uh, constitutional changes. And this might be the time to rethink the inherited two-party system. And whether the two-party system does not limit the range of political representation. And that involves a lot of rethinking politically in the Caribbean that they seem so reluctant to do about whether they do need some of these representative heads, whether their parliaments are too big and expensive, whether their proportional representation is the proper form that they should have, and whether there might not be uh, a, a, a devolution of, to local authorities or the county or parish levels of forms of administration or even forms of taxation that might be effective over the long run. And the final one, of course, is I have no solution to this. This is a major international problem, is the impact that international nar narcotic trafficking represents in the Caribbean and elsewhere. And what it is is quite simple. It is that uh, the international drug dealers have more resources than any individual state in the Americas today. And that includes the United States uh, of America. And unless we can cooperate about how we approach it as a public health problem or as a different form of economic or tariff system, this is going to be a major problem. And it is an expensive one because the amount of resources invested in resolving this international narcotics trafficking is in fact money that is not spent in other needed areas of the society, in public health, in education, in infrastructure, and so on. The law and order should not be allowed to drain scarce resources from these societies, because even in societies which consider themselves generously endowed, uh, such as Trinidad and Tobago, there is an inordinate cost uh, which exceeds, uh, which, which is abnormal in this age. The constant laments about legacies of slavery, legacies of imperialism, legacies of colonialism or globalization, you will notice, perhaps not featured prominently in my diagnosis 
of the challenges confronting Caribbean societies. I believe, as William Shakespeare once expressed through the words of Cassius and Julius Caesar, the fault, their Brutus, lies not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Subordination is nothing new to the human conditions, and many have overcome that handicap, and I believe so can the people of the Caribbean. The various independent Caribbean states cannot and must not depend on outsiders to chart their futures, nor should they rely inordinately on external support to achieve their goals. They must take control of their destiny, and this is a matter of the utmost urgency. And to do so, they must be tough, they need to be creative, and they have to be resilient. Salvation and defense will not come from wishful thinking or from outsiders. In other words, not from the stars, but from within, from ourselves. That is largely what Caribbean history patently manifests. And there is one final observation, that to do well in the future, these are not the times when we have to produce independent strategies for independent states. We have to be selective about the best form to achieve and sustain the good society and the good life to which we all aspire. Because if we do not, regardless of our present status today, those words attributed to various people, the English Parliament in 1642, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Paine in the 1760s, which says, if we do not hang together, we will certainly hang separately if we take independent courses of action. And coming together, as I implied, does not necessarily require the construction of yet another collective organization with a big budget and a lot of semi-employable types manning them. We need to take something like transportation and say, what do we want for Caribbean transportation? We want to be able to go from Trinidad to Jamaica in one hour, three times per day, and so on. We need to realize that we should bring the Caribbean together in our transportation plans before we try to get people to London, Toronto, or New York. But again, that exceeds my mandate for tonight. I am here to say that I think, and it is my considered opinion, that Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago are still politically young. And indeed, so is the modern Caribbean. And I remain extremely confident that the best days of Caribbean societies are yet to come. We may stumble, we may falter, but we cannot afford to fail. Too much is at stake for us and for those we love. And so we must continue to do our best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Profession, Professor Knight, for your brilliant, insightful, and engaging lecture. I didn't mean to rush you off the stage. Thank you very much. As you will no doubt appreciate, this lecture requires enormous effort. And in our 50th year, we would like to extend the contribution beyond just tonight. A few weeks ago, we presented the Dr. Rudranath Kapaldeo Young Scientist Award to an outstanding physics student and $10,000 in units from UTC for his use in his future educational pursuits. Tonight, we are pleased to introduce another prize and contribution to a young academic in the making who may one day follow in the footsteps of Dr. Williams. We call on Professor Knight again to come forward. 
to present the Dr. Eric Williams History Award and $10,000 in units to drum roll Kishav Kasano, a Form 6 student of Queen's Royal College. Kishav, please come forward. Congratulations, Kassav. And we, you, can, you can use these chairs. But Professor Knight, you need to stay. Yeah. And I'd like to invite Governor, you're hoping for? A clean getaway. <laughs> We'd like to invite Governor to come forward. And Governor will make a presentation to Professor Knight, just as a token of appreciation to you from us for all that you have done and for your wonderful lecture this, this evening. It's heavy. Thank you, Governor and Professor Dyke. Brennan, you can, um, you can, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Professor Knight. Thank you. Thank you. 